glad to have you with us. But we always have guests, and you're always honored, our honored uh, guests to be here. Well, Blake and Frank are both preaching away elsewhere this morning, and uh, I, my understanding is uh, Blake is in Tharptown and, and uh, Frank is in the Athens area. Both will be back with us tonight if the Lord wills. I'm thankful that, that uh, these men have opportunities. Of course, Frank has preached for many years, and uh, Blake is uh, beginning that process and beginning to have opportunities to do that, and I'm grateful and thankful for that. We miss them, of course, when they're not with us, uh, but we're grateful that they have those opportunities. And so we'll look forward to having them back with us tonight. Thursday afternoon, uh, Beth and I went over to Andy's house and visited with that family. And uh, we did that at their request, and that's certainly something that I wanted to do uh, in that I was asked to be a part of the service. And uh, typically what preachers do before speaking at funeral services is that they go and spend some time with the family. We were able to do that Thursday afternoon. And what is discussed at those gatherings and what uh, you might think are discussed would be no surprise to you. Uh, families are sad, but families sit around and families talk about the past. Many times that focuses on that loved one and talk about what they will remember. And really what I found out that we're talking about leaving a legacy. We're talking about when, when someone passes away, when I pass away, what is it that I'm going to leave? Yesterday morning, uh, my plan was to preach on something else this morning. And as I attended that service yesterday, Gene's memorial services, and I thought about some of the things that not only that family told me about Gene, but about some of the things that you told me about, about Gene. I felt like that this lesson this morning might be more appropriate. And what I, I don't want this morning to restate what I mentioned at Gene's funeral, funeral yesterday, but I will tell you that the things that uh, happened yesterday and the things that I have heard have certainly driven what I want to talk to you about today. Verbin and Jean Jones were a part of this church for a long time. I had the good fortune of knowing them in a limited way. Once I married Beth and I began to come this way a little bit more often, I began to know them a little bit more. But a lot of you, most of you, had the opportunity to know them quite well. Verbin and Jean have influenced people here for a long time. If you count both of them, as I count, there are at least 20 people who are a part of this assembly on a regular basis, who are part of that family. And as I think about what happened yesterday, I am reminded of what the wisdom writer says in Ecclesiastes 7 when he says, A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Better to go to a house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. <laughs> every, almost every person from this church who spoke to me yesterday said something about, something to this effect. You know, what's happened to Gene is going to happen to us. I shared some things with Olin Thompson, and I love talking to Olin for a number of reasons, but we were just talking about that we're all headed toward the end of life and that funerals are sobering times, and that is the case. And even though I think yesterday we and, our, and Jean's family celebrated her life, they are sobering moments because, as the, the wisdom writer says, the living are the ones who really gain from a memorial service or from a day of mourning. It's not the person who has passed. 
And as I stated yesterday, Gene's eternal destiny sealed. Yesterday wasn't really about Gene. Yesterday was really about those of us who were there and who were able to use our minds because we are still on this side of eternity to determine what it is that we're doing and what kind of, if you will, legacy that we ourselves are leaving. And so they help us evaluate what we think we might leave. And I think that leaving a legacy gets more traction as we get older. I think that's why that a lot of you who speak to me on those occasions are, are older because they are challenging in your mind because you realize, even many of you who sit in this assembly this morning realize that you're the same age of Gene or you're in the same generation of Gene and you're concerned about that from a just from a point of view that says, you know, if all goes as the natural circumstance goes, we don't have much time to live. So those things that ought to become serious to us become even more serious to us because of our circumstances in life. And that is exactly what's supposed to happen. That's what God wants. And so we have to use moments like yesterday and moments like not long ago when our brother Bill Hester passed away. And as we think about others who have passed in recent months and years, and as we no doubt will consider in the next few weeks and months and years and possibly days, possibly hours about others among us who will pass. It challenges us. And if I can say it, I think it should sober us very, very much to consider what it is that we will leave. I want you to turn in your Old Testaments to 1 Chronicles 22. As I thought about some things this morning that I wanted to share with you, uh, the, the life of David came to my mind, and I'm going to share some thoughts from 1 Chronicles 22 with you this morning about David's way, about what David left. And I'm going to look at it specifically as 1 Chronicles 22 sets for us, David's preparation to build a, a temple. And we all know that those circumstances changed. David wanted to build the temple for the Lord, and he was told, even in this text, that that would not happen because of him shedding too much blood. We all know that David didn't build it, but I want you to notice with me today what he did, and we're going to look at it, and I think make some principled applications that I think will be helpful to us. And, and when you leave here this morning, here's what, I, here's what I hope to accomplish. I hope when you leave here this morning, you evaluate what it is that you're leaving not just to your family, not just to your children, not just to a wife or a husband or an even extended family, but what you're leaving to us. What is it, what is it that, 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 that if I'm alive and if others here are alive when you pass, what is it that you have left? What has your life said? What has it meant? What has it done for those of us who may possibly remain? Beginning in verse 1, Then David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. So David commanded to gather the aliens who were in the land of Israel, and he appointed basins to cut hewn stones to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails of the doors of the gates and for the joints in bronze in abundance beyond measure. And cedar trees in abundance for the Sidonians and those from Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. Now David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, famous, and glorious throughout all countries. I will now make preparations for it. So David made abundant preparations before his death. May I suggest to you first of all this morning that if we're going to leave a legacy, we have to plan. We have to plan what it is that we're wanting to leave. David didn't quit when God told him, you know, you're not going to build this house for me, David. And David knew the, the magnificence that it had to entail, but God said, David, you're not going to do that. And yet David didn't quit. David didn't pout. David said, well, I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to accomplish what I can accomplish. So he got busy. He gathered stone cutters. He provided materials. And I want you to notice in, the, in those verses we just read, not the materials, but what it says about the materials. It says he, he, he uh, got these things in abundance. It says that numerous times. I mean, he, he really took it upon himself to do what he needed to do. Verse 5 says, David made abundant preparations before his death. And so my question to us this morning is, are, are we planning our legacy? And I'm not suggesting that we're planning it in some arrogant way. 
What I'm talking about is the life that we're living. Are we planning our legacy? And I would suggest to us this morning that good legacies aren't by accident. I don't think Jean Jones left a good legacy just by accident. She didn't. Just, it wasn't just by luck that, that she's had all this influence in her life. Good legacies are left by someone who plans. And may I suggest to all of us that once we pass from this life, we cannot change our legacy. It takes preparation. What does your life today, if your life ended right now, what is it that you would leave your family? Isn't that a sobering thought? <laughs> Isn't that a sobering thought? <laughs> if you died right now, what is it that your family would have? What is it that they could hold on to that would really be valuable? That's the question that we're talking about. And I must suggest this to you. You know, our families may not even appreciate what it is that we leave. You know, there may be an opportunity in which we leave this legacy and our children may not even fully realize what we've left them. Because they don't appreciate those kind of things. They don't appreciate those spiritual and godly things that we're trying to leave them. It may be that they don't understand it. But even if they don't, we need to leave that legacy with them. And David planned. He said, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to do. If I'm not going to be able to do this, let me accomplish this. And so he began to work toward that end. Beginning in verse 6, it goes on to say, Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have made great wars, and you shall not build a house for my name, because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to you, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies all around. His name shall be Solomon, for I will give peace and greatness and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. This is what David did when he called for his son. And I would suggest this morning that what he did is he said, I'm going to show you what it is that I want to leave. I'm going to, in essence, I want to educate you. I want to tell you what it is that I'm going to leave you. David explained the plan to Solomon. He talked to him about what he was doing and why. And it wasn't just what I'm doing, but, it, but it's, it's why this was important. And I want to suggest this morning that we need to do the same. What are you showing and what are you telling your family is important? What, what is it that you're showing by your life? What is it that you're showing them is really important? I'm not suggesting that providing for them in ways that may even be magnificent, in ways that, that may even be above what others have. I'm not suggesting that's wrong, but I'm saying this to us. What is it that we're telling them by how we're living our lives? One of the many things that impressed me about Gene, and, and, and I might even say this. In the course of the conversation and talking to the family about Gene, they stressed to me that Jean had learned to live her life in contentment regardless of her circumstances. And this audience, many of you in this audience understand her circumstances. You understand that there were times in her life when she and her husband abounded. They abounded in material things and they had things and they were able to live in such a way that, that maybe others, several others or many others couldn't. And yet there was a time in their life when they became abased, when they had to live with, with much less, much less, considerably less than even they had had. And circumstances had changed. And I think what impressed me about all four children as they talked to me about that is, is that, you know, that's the mom was the same and whatever those circumstances were, that did that wasn't who made her. But what she was doing is she was showing, you know, this is the way you live when things are good, this is the way you live when things aren't as good. And that's a good legacy. That's a great legacy to leave your kids and to leave others like all of us who knew Jean and who knew these were her circumstances throughout her life. We didn't know everything about that. You didn't know everything about that, but you knew a lot of that. And here is a woman whose testament to all of us is be content, be content. 
you are aware as well of a, a friend of mine and a friend of many who are in this audience who lives in Bowling Green, Kentucky, named Ken Marshall. I have mentioned him by email. I've mentioned him in our assembly. I think Ken is about my age, maybe a little younger. He uh, has prostate cancer, a very rare form. And his circumstance and, and all the testing that has been done has concluded that, uh, frankly, there's little that can be done for him, although he is planning to undergo some chemo. And as, my, as I understand it, the purpose of that is to just maybe give him more time so that possibly something could be found that might be able to help him. It's one of those situations. And I want to share with you a text that I received from Ken. And I quote, he said, I tossed the pride out the window a while back. This has already been quite a journey. I know it is in God's hands and I'm at peace with that. I'm just readying for the fight. Now if, he can, if he can live and if he can fight another day, that's a legacy to be left. I know his wife, his three children. And I think about him as I'm standing here today talking to him, talking to you about him. I'm thinking as he sits in an assembly very similar to this in Bowling Green, Kentucky, today, what is going through his mind? As he, unlike me, understands in a very real way that very probably unless something is developed and unless something does happen, that his time is very much limited. What do you do? What do you do? You fight. You have faith. You ready yourself for the fight, as he said, and, and, and you toss everything out that makes you think that somehow you think you can accomplish something. That's what he said. I've tossed out all my pride. Gone a long time ago. And I have many times over the past week, I have many times thought if that information is given to me one day. And there is a very real chance that something like that could happen to all of us, to any of us. Are we going to fight and leave the legacy that I know Ken hopes to leave? There's no guarantees in his life, but his intention and his desire is to leave the kind of legacy that says, I'm not quitting. And I'm not complaining. I'll live for the king as long as I can. That's what he's planning to do. And folks, I would suggest that if we're going to leave a legacy, that's what we have to do. He's been teaching faith all his life. And now he's got to live it. I've taught it most all my life. But I've never had to do what he's had to do. Not yet. I may. There may come a time when I stand before you under the same conditions, preaching for as long as I can. There may be that time. I don't know. But he has an opportunity to leave that kind of legacy. And I believe that he will. Verse 11 goes on to say, Now, my son, may the Lord be with you, and may you prosper and build the house of the Lord your God as he has said to you. Only may the Lord give you wisdom and understanding and give you charge concerning Israel that you may keep the law of the Lord your God then you will prosper if you take care to fulfill the statutes and judgments with which the Lord charged Moses concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be dismayed. May I suggest to you that when we leave a legacy, we need to be people who encourage. David and David's admonitions here later are, are to tell Solomon that he wouldn't fail if he walked with the Lord. He asked God to give Solomon discretion and understanding. And what I see in these statements that David makes, obviously toward the latter part of his life, as he knows now he's not going to build the temple, but as he's encouraging his son to build the temple, these are encouraging words. You know, don't, don't fail the Lord. Don't fail others. And he says in verse 13, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Be positive, I think. Be helpful. Be uplifting. Be prayerful. Be encouraging. 
And all of those things that he says here I think are just encouraging words. And we need to be people who are encouraging. Let me just say this. There are people who are discouragers. That's the way they live life. They're negative. They're not positive. They're, they're, they're discouraging because of, of maybe circumstances. I, I don't know what all tends to lend itself to why a person is the way a person may be. And I'm not suggesting that there are not moments in our lives when all of us become discouraged, when all of us become even temperamental. David, I think, saw this as an opportunity to encourage his son. Paul would say in the New Testament that fathers are not to provoke their children to wrath, but to encourage, to help, to be positive. May I just suggest this? This is just, I think, a thought that needs to be expressed uh, and that I think would help us all. Just, just be a person who takes the time to encourage. As, as you know, I spent a few days, a few weeks ago in Gainesville holding a meeting. And, and not probably a day after I got home, I got this note, this thank you note in the mail. And I got it about the time I got home or maybe a day after that. So I know that Ben sent this to me before I'd even left Gainesville. I'm not going to read it to you, but I just want to say this. This man's name is Ben Doerr. And Ben and his wife Bonnie worship at the church in Gainesville where I held the meeting and I've known them. I don't know, don't know them well, but I've known them. I've known their children. But, but basically what Ben was saying is, thank you for coming and sharing yourself with us. I'm not, I'm not sharing this with you to say, look what somebody sent Kenny. I'm not doing that at all. I think you know me well. No, that's not why I share this. I share this with you because here's a man who took probably, I mean, it took him a while to just write that. It just took him a while to do that. And, and to just say thank you for coming and taking the time and sharing some things that helped me. And, and, and the, at the end of this, he said, we pray you were encouraged and glad as much as we were. And I can tell you right now, I texted him back when I got this, and I said, well, you can, you can take this to the bank. But it helped Beth and me more than it helped you. It was a great encouragement for us to be with them. And as I think about a man like David, and I think about people like you who, who send things like this to me and to others by way of encouragement, it just adds to who you are in my book. Because you've taken the time to say, you know, I want to say something to you that's important. Expect 150 thank you notes this week. Don't misunderstand my point. I'm just simply saying to us, Folks, be an encourager. Leave a legacy that says, you know, this is something that I can do. Somebody said, well, I, I can't do much. i tell you what, you can do this. You can do this. And I can do this. Help us to be people like Ben Dore, who are people who encourage. And then we need to invest. Verse 14 says this, Indeed, I have taken much trouble to prepare for the house of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold, 1 million talents of silver, and bronze and iron beyond measure, for it is so abundant. I have prepared timber and stone also, and you may add to them. Moreover, there are workmen with you in abundance, woodsmen, stone cutters, and all types of skillful men for every kind of work. Of gold and silver and bronze and iron, there is no limit. Arise and begin working, and the Lord be with you. Basically what David says, with much trouble I have provided all these things for you. I don't think David's saying, look at all I've done. I think he's saying, this is what I want to do. This is what I can do. And the amount of time and the amount of money and the amount of energy and effort that he provided for this opportunity that had not yet come to pass but that Solomon was asked to do was staggering. And I would suggest that David saw this as an opportunity to provide for something that would be an investment. He was investing in something, and that's what we have to do. We have to invest in people spiritually. It's the only thing that lasts. I mean, those, those conversations to folks that have to do with what the Lord wants and what the Lord expects and what the Lord can provide and what the Lord can do, those kind of conversations build legacies. It's not what I leave to somebody materially. I, nothing wrong with that. I, I suppose that 
when a person passes, the, the rightful thing to do is to leave what was theirs to those who were still on earth who were theirs. I suppose that is the right thing to do. That makes perfect sense. I think that's even a biblical. But, but if what I leave to those who are dear to me is something that's material, it's going to, what's going to happen to that is exactly what happened to me. It's just going to die. It's just going to fade away. And if it's still alive and it's still not alive, but if it's still in its state when the Lord comes back, it's just going to be burned up with everything else. And what difference does it make, right? So we need to invest in people spiritually. And then let me suggest this. David enlisted the help of others. In verse 17 it says, David also commanded all the leaders of Israel to help Solomon his son, saying, Is not the Lord your God with you? And has he not given you rest on every side? For he has given the inhabitants of the land into my hand and the Lord and the land to subdue before the Lord and before his people. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Therefore rise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy articles of God into the house that is to be built for the name of the Lord. I mean Solomon couldn't do that by himself. Solomon was the one who perpetuated it, but it wasn't Solomon who made everything happen. Solomon had to enlist others. We do that too. As we build legacies, we enlist others as well. I, I think, uh, I, again, sitting at Andy's house and hearing the family talk, a lot, a lot of what they talked about went back to about when those families lived about two or three blocks from here. And there were several families who lived close together. And I just enjoyed hearing the families talk about, you know, the Hills and the Threets and the Hibbets and the Joneses and those families who were around. And, and those of you who remember those days, I mean, those families were close. I've heard my wife talk about those days a lot to the point where I kind of wish I was around there for some of that. But, you know, what Gene did and what those other families, they, they enlisted the help of other people. And those families were part of this church. They enlisted the help of this church. Maybe not officially, <laughs> help me, but that's what was going on. That's what's going on today. These young families who are having children and trying to raise children. I'll think about Jason and Ellen. And as Audrey continues to grow and be a part of this church, I mean, they, they in essence have enlisted us to help leave Audrey a legacy that will change her life forever. That's, that's what happens to us. And, and those of you who are part of this group, you've enlisted the help of the elders here. You've enlisted the help of, of me. You've enlisted the help of every member. Some of the most godly women I know worship right here and live right here. And you've enlisted the help of those people. Because you can't do it yourself. You've got to have help. And Gina understood that. And Verbin understood that. I think because they did some things in their life to do that, that kind of influence that has been a part of that family and continues to be a part of that family just lives on. David said, I need some other folks to help. And evidently they did. And I want to mention one other thought. I think this is important because a lesson like this not only, I think, helps us maybe focus on the fact of just asking the questions, what are we leaving, but it can discourage us. I, I know a lesson like this can discourage us because for, for all of us to some degree, we look at this and we go, you know, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. But man, I wish I, could, I wish I would have done so many other things. I, I wish I would have, I wish this would have changed. I wish I could have done this differently and that differently. And maybe the outcome would have been different. Maybe it would have been a, a different circumstance for my children if I'd done this. I get all that. I'm, I'm with you. I feel you. I feel with you. I understand. Don't you think David felt that way? Don't you think David felt that way? Can you imagine later in David's life as he's sitting there probably close to death? Can't you imagine David saying, can you believe that I've done what I've done in my life? All the great things that he did. Whew, he had a dark time. He had a dark time. 
But even in his dark time, he didn't quit. Even in his dark time, he didn't say, well, whew, I've made so many mistakes. I can't overcome them. Let me tell you what. If David can overcome it, you and I can overcome it. If his, if his life teaches me anything, and it teaches me a lot of things, but if it teaches me anything, it teaches me this. I don't have to be perfect to leave a good legacy. But I need to have the right kind of heart. David was a man after God's own heart. It doesn't say after that, even though he was perfect. If anybody wasn't perfect, it was David. And yet David left a legacy that not only, I think, affected Solomon, but affected the rest of his family and affected a lot of other folks in Israel. And isn't this true? It affects us today. His influence still lingers. And I have no doubt that Solomon knew what happened to his father early in his life. I don't know how often his father and, and, and he talked about those, that episode in his life. But, you know, it's kind of hard for him to say, I don't think I'm going to tell Solomon about my past. Everybody knew his past. The whole nation knew his past. Even the nations that weren't his nation knew his past. Everybody knew his past. But yet, he didn't quit, didn't stop, didn't feel sorry for herself and throw a pity party and say, well, I'm done. I, you know, I can't overcome. He said, I can't overcome. And he did overcome it. And you and I can overcome it too. And we can do the very best we can to leave the kind of legacy that God wants. I think, from my perspective, that's what happened to Gene Jones. And that's what can happen to us. Well, I had to say that this morning because it's kind of hard to get Gene off my mind. And a lot of times the people that we know best are the people that can teach us the most. And so let her life live. Let her memory live in you. Let her influence continue to live. And let her influence influence you to make the kind of decisions that she made to say, this is my life. I'm going to make the best of it in no matter what it is, and I'm going to leave to the best of my ability the best legacy that I can. We all can do that. May God help us toward that end. If you have a spiritual need this morning, we're here to help you. We want you to think about it. It may not be that you need to make some sort of a public acknowledgement wrong in your life, it may be that you do. Maybe you need to let people know that you're willing to change and you want people to pray for you. And we'd love to do that. We would be more than happy. We would welcome the opportunity to do it for you. It may be that you need to just come to Christ this morning and do what the New Testament teaches you to do in order to become a Christian. Maybe you say, it's time for me to do that and I want to begin that today. Do that. But it may simply be that you just need to say, look, today's a new day. I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm going to do what I have to do to leave the kind of legacy that God wants me to leave. And then make up your mind to do that. But if you have a need this morning that we can help you with, we want you to come as we stand and as we sing.